This is episode number eight, where we'll learn about creating a charmed life with author Victoria Moran. Welcome. I'm Kimberly Henry, and this is Living the Good Life. Hello, 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 and thank you for tuning in to this episode. I'm so glad to be with you. It's been a fantastic week. I hope it's been a great week for you as well. And I want to thank those of you who reached out to me after last week's episode where I got a little bit of emotional stuff going on there. It's a topic really near and dear to my heart, and a lot of folks seem to resonate with that. So just want to thank you for letting me know and letting me know that you enjoyed it, listened and got something out of it. So if you haven't checked that one out, definitely do. It's episode number seven with Adam Bricker and Avery Russell, and a little bit of my experience as well. So love to have you let me know if you haven't, what it meant for you. Today's episode I'm super excited about. When I read this book, it was just one of those books where you just, yes, 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 all the way through it, just completely resonated for me, and I hope it will for you. The book is Creating a Charm Life. The author is Victoria Moran, and it has 75 unique little chapters. It's a super easy, quick read, but it will make such an impact if you really want to create your best life. So I encourage you to go out and grab that book. Now, we spent quite a bit of time talking, Victoria and I, and I really loved our time together. So without further ado, let's just cut right to the chase and join our guest. Our guest today is the author of 13 books, including Main Street Vegan, Creating a Charmed Life, Fit from Within, and Younger by the Day. Featured twice on Oprah and voted PETA's sexiest vegan over 50 in 2016. She hosts the Main Street Vegan podcast and is director of Main Street Vegan Academy, the exciting week-long intensive in New York City training and certifying vegan lifestyle coaches. She's also the lead producer of A Prayer for Compassion, Thomas Jackson's 2019 documentary introducing vegan living to people of faith. And we'll talk about that coming up. It is my pleasure to welcome to our program, Victoria Moran. Victoria? Why, thank you for having me, Kimberly. This is a joy. It is fantastic for us to connect. We have a mutual friend in common who let me know about your work, and I loved how particularly creating a charm life fits almost exactly in with what we're talking about here on living the good life. Well, that was a very magical book for me and for, I think about 200,000 people around the world. You know, somebody wrote to me once and said, I love all your books, but creating a charmed life, that one's blessed. And I think she really put it right because it, it did speak to people in a very, very special way. And um, I love that idea. I think some of those uh, little concepts, it's uh, 75 tiny chapters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so much of what we say in this, you know, kind of self-improvement, consciousness raising a kind of, of world is is a re explanation of things that we already know. And there's certainly some of that in there. But I think what made creating a charmed life so special is that some of the stuff just seemed inspired. And it seemed like one of uh, everybody's favorite chapters was called Play Your Free Square. So if you've ever played bingo, you know that in the middle of the bingo card, mm -hmm. you have this free square and you get it no matter what, and you don't have to be smart and you don't have to pay extra, you just get it. And my contention is that we all have a free square in life. This is something that is just easy for us. It just comes naturally to us and we wonder why everybody doesn't have it. And I think if you really look at your life and think about it, you can see what yours is. Mine is definitely connecting with people, either wonderful connections like I'm having with you right now because of a mutual friend whom I don't think I've seen in three years. <laughs> oh, wow. Friends. And I also just run into people, uh, helpful people, famous people. It's just my free square and everybody's got one and people love those kind of concepts and 74 others. So yeah, for many years, I was the charmed life lady and uh, it's kind of a nice thing to be. Well, I think even though maybe you've moved on to some other concepts and we'll, we'll, I'd love to catch up on what you're doing now, but you're using from what I can see the outside looking in 
all of these concepts that you wrote about, about back in 1999. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I think whenever you start on this path of enlightenment, somebody said to me a long time ago, when this way of life, this way of just looking at life kind of from up on the hill, when it touches you anywhere, it touches you everywhere. And what I've seen on my path, which I've been on quite a long time, <laughs> are improvements in, in health, in outlook, in finances, in relationships. It really does seem to be true that when you're operating on a higher level, all parts of your life, what is that thing about rising tides uh, raise all boats or raise something all, like yes, that. Yes, raise all ships. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Now, your book titled Creating a Charm Life and this podcast, Living the Good Life, I think most of us think, well, that's great for them. That was something bestowed upon them. It's not for me. And I love in your introduction in this book, you talk about your intention is to make it a viable option for anyone willing to do the work. So what you're saying, if I'm getting this right, is that this is something that's open to all of us. Absolutely. You don't have to be born into a certain social class or with a certain IQ or whatever it is to have magic in your life. And that's really what this oh, is I about. Oh, I love that. Yes, I love Little that. Little snips of serendipity that just push you forward, keep you going. Now, this is not a, a immunization against hardship or crisis or sadness or disappointment or any of those things, because those are all in the package for every one of us. And yet, whenever you're going through, whatever you're going through, mm -hmm. if you can just get these little light bursts, these little wonderful things that happen spontaneously. And, and they do happen to me a lot. And I think that is because I've cultivated them. Just this morning, for example, just before I came home to sit down here and, and talk with you, I went in for my monthly facial. Well, I'd actually gone there on Sunday because it said on my eye calendar, <laughs> two <laughs> o'clock Sunday, that's your face. And they said to me, oh no, you're down for three o'clock on Monday. I said, that is absolutely impossible. I cannot do that. So they said, well, we can't put you with your regular person, but we could get you in on Wednesday. So I went and I said to this total stranger, how's it going for you? She said, fine. Well, I did have a loss in my family. Oh. I'm sorry. She said, well, it was my grandmother. And I think she expected me to say, oh, well, you know, almost like, well, that's okay. She was old. She can go. She said, it was my grandmother, but we were so close. I said, well, I was close to my grandmother. In fact, she raised me. She was my first spiritual teacher. And this woman said, so was mine. And so all through this hour, this complete stranger was sharing with me about her grandmother, whom she said was like Sophia Loren. And that gave me the oh. opportunity to recommend to her my favorite vintage film, 1958, Rosalind Russell, Auntie Mame. If you haven't seen it, you have to see it because she was the ultimate in living a charmed life. She would say to her little um, nephew, Patrick, your Auntie Mame is going to open doors for you, Patrick doors you never even dreamed existed. And then she'd say, you know, life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death. <laughs> so when you're taught by these kinds of people, real and imaginary, mm -hmm. <laughs> bring these principles into your life, it just invites these interesting little accidents. Why did I show up there on Sunday and come back on Tuesday? It was because I'm supposed to talk to this woman today. And I think if you're open to these kinds of things, then it goes both ways. You show up for other people and they show up for you. I love moments like that. I feel like I'm almost always just in that wow period of, wow, this, this is a connection that neither one of us could have anticipated or um, orchestrated, yet there's so much synergy in this conversation, and that just lights you up. 
It does. And to me, it's all about being lit up. And I know a lot of people are very serious. They're very pragmatic. They're looking at business and bottom lines. And that is all excellent. But without this other piece, without this concept of what lights you up, then you're just always going to be marching along like a cog in a wheel because you came into this world, I believe, to shine your light, to be this wonderful uplift to everybody else. And when you can zero in on your particular gifts, your special reason for being here, what you have to offer that nobody else can, you feel really good. You feel like, wow, it's not going to take much air here to get me airborne. (laughs) And that's when you're most effective. Mm -hmm. You're not just, okay, that's fine. We're going to give you an A. It's like, no, we're going to give you the world. That's a fantastic way to look at it. I love the names. You mentioned your chapters, your 75 chapters, by the way, in your book. I love the names of your, the way that you did these. Things like enjoy your eccentricities and drink good coffee, eat good food. I'm all about that. I'd love for you to expand a little bit on retire your tutu. <laughs> Well, we very often, when we're getting down on ourselves, we say, well, I'm too. Too what? Doesn't matter. I'm too fat. I'm too old. I'm too poor. I'm too young. I'm too dumb. You know, get rid of the tutu. It's like, okay, you're young. Oh my goodness. Everything in life is open and available to you. You're old. Oh my goodness. You have all this wisdom. You've navigated some of these things before and you know your way around. If you take the two away, all these things that we put the two in front of can become positives instead of negatives. And then we work with them. And something that you really do want to change, you know, I'm too heavy or whatever that thing is. Whenever you take away the two, which is a judgment call, and you just say, hump, you know? I'm about 30 pounds heavier than I would like to be. Let me uh, look at that and see if I want to just enjoy myself and live my life and be who I am. Or do I want to look at the 30 pounds or maybe 15 of them? With the two gone, everything becomes possible. So it becomes an empowering statement versus a a self-judgment or or what? Exactly. And we need that desperately... You know, very few of us have people insulting us on a daily basis. Although I guess if you spend a lot of time on social media, (laughs) (laughs) but most of us insult ourselves on a daily basis. Yes. There's no reason for it. I know that we think that we're being honest or we're being humble or we're, we're really not deluding ourselves. Well, you know what? We are deluding ourselves because the truth is, the people who need to be criticized are the ones who are not criticizing themselves. They think they're great. <laughs> so let them be. They've got their own path. Sure. But if you're someone who is always judging yourself, you're just not quite right. You're coming up short. Oh my gosh, I made a mistake. I should be banished and exiled. You know what? You made a mistake so that everybody can relate to you. A few years ago, I wanted to have a personal trainer for a while, and I asked the manager of the gym who he thought would be good for me, and he said, oh, Wendy, you'd love Wendy, you guys would work great together. So I went home and looked up Wendy, and here was this woman with this very short haircut, kind of a flat top, you know, like the old time Marines, and she had this two-piece outfit on, and she had an eight pack. I mean, I counted all eight. I didn't even know women could get that. And she looked like she'd be so mean and scary. So I wrote to her after he had introduced us and I said, I'm sorry, but this is just not going to work out. And she wrote back to me and said, oh, I'm so sorry because I've looked you up and I see that you're vegan. Well, I'm vegan and I would love to work with you. And I thought, okay, give the woman a chance. Well, she turned out to be magnificent and she has in fact turned into a friend. Mm -hmm. But I was judging her not because she wasn't good at what she did or not because she didn't look like somebody who really knew how to exercise. I was judging her because she was too good at it. So (laughs) we've got to be able to just 
ease into ourselves and just allow, you know, there's something about an elastic waist, you know, we don't want to wear them every day, (laughs) but sometimes, you know, it's a couple of days after Thanksgiving or you're just kind of feeling like, I don't want to be confined and controlled today. I'm going to put on those pants or that skirt with the elastic waist. And if you can live your life with a little bit of an elastic waist, that means give yourself some slack, mm-hmm. give other people some slack. It's all going to work better. I was at a workshop about 10 months ago that really profoundly changed my life. This just one statement or one rule that plays right into what you're talking about. We all know the golden rule is to treat others the way that we would want to be treated. And he introduced to us, the speaker at this workshop, the platinum rule, which was to treat yourself the way others would want to be treated. Ooh. (laughs) Because we tend to treat other people so much better then we treat ourselves. Yes. And I heard that and I thought that is exactly what I do for sure. You know, you look in the mirror and you, you say all kinds of horrible things you would never say to your best friend, make all kinds of judgments. So I hear, I hear what you're saying. And I think it makes such a huge difference if you can remove that judgment from yourself and from the people around you. Yeah. Well, one of the things that was taught by Dale Carnegie in his Mm. classic book from the 1930s, How to Influence, How to Win Friends and Influence Mm -hmm. People, is you don't want to complain, criticize, or condemn. Yes. He was talking about other people and in business concepts, and if you need to show a subordinate or a coworker how to do something differently, you do that without complaining, criticizing, or condemning. And we need to apply that to ourselves as well. If something's not going well, well, okay, let's do it differently. Let's not complain. If I did something wrong, oh my gosh, I know I did it. I don't have to criticize myself. And I certainly don't have to add on to criticism, condemnation of you did that you're just out for the count. You're just out of the game. You're right. washed up. You're used up. You're not relevant anymore. Or how could you misspell a word in an email? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so no, no complaint, no criticism, no condemning. There's a good three C's. I absolutely, I'm a student of the Dale Carnegie um, program and I keep that little booklet with me all the time. It is magical. My mother was a great saleswoman in in her day to the point that I was speaking in Springfield, Missouri a few years ago, and I went to a mall there and I'd been shopping. I was kind of tired and they had a display of these massaging chairs, which at one time she sold in the middle of the mall. And I sat down in the chair and I'm relaxing. And the young man came over to give me the sales pitch. And I kind of interrupted him and said, you know, I know all about these chairs because my mother used to sell them back in the day. And he looked like he'd seen a ghost. And he said, your mother isn't Gladys Marshall, is she? And I said, well, she was, but she passed away a while ago and she worked at that company before you were born. And he said, I know, but they still talk about her. Oh, wow. So she was a student of Dale Carnegie. And that was why I didn't read the book until I was in my fifties, because I thought, how could it possibly be relevant? My mother read it. (laughs) But what's so interesting, the truth is the truth and it stands the test Mm -hmm. of time. I mean, certainly we see this with the scriptures of the world and, and, and the great classics that still make sense and, and still apply. But that book worked for her in the 1950s and it's working for you and me in 2019. Absolutely. You are right. As your book, as I mentioned earlier, written 1999, well, that's when it was published. So we're, here we are 20 years later, it's still very relevant because it breathes that, that truth. It's fundamental. It's amazing. How has it worked for you? Now, we've talked about you know, bits and pieces about it, but it's work. As you mentioned, even in the introduction to your book, it's work to live that charm life that we think should come so easily. Is it worth it? Oh, it's absolutely worth it because what else can you do? The only other thing is just pick up your toys and go home. To me, 
you can either decide to live Thoreau's life of quiet desperation, or you can do something different. And this doesn't mean that I don't get discouraged. In fact, I think I get discouraged more than most people. You know how they say that if you need to learn something, you teach it. You don't get into writing self-help books and doing the things that I do with my life if (laughs) you don't need what you're teaching. So I believe that I am congenitally negative. And there are some people who are congenitively positive. Mm -hmm. They just always see the bright side of things. And I I stand there and look at them and it's like, wow, are you serious? And you haven't gone to seminars and (laughs) all this stuff. And that's just how they are. And that's wonderful. But for me, it really is work. And so Mm -hmm. one thing that I do is set aside morning time that is absolutely sacrosanct. And that doesn't mean that I don't sometimes goof. But the main thing for my morning is that I do not turn on electronics until I am ready to start my day. This thing of, well, I'm just going to look at the email. I'm just going to go to Facebook and see what's happening in the world. That is like going down a trap door. Maybe some people are very disciplined and they can do it for 10 minutes and that's it. But Mm -hmm. most of us that just starts us down a primrose path we don't want to go on. So for me, I do like to get up early in the morning. I meditate. I exercise. And that's actually a little uh, acronym that I came up with in my book, Younger by the Day. And that is me, M-E. You take care of me in the morning with meditation and exercise. And then you can take care of the rest of your life and everybody in it all day long. So I like to do those things. I walk my dog. Living with a dog is just wonderful. (laughs) Wonderful, (laughs) wonderful, wonderful. I just saw the movie A Dog's Way Home. Oh my gosh, it was fabulous. Um, And and then I eat breakfast, you know, most important meal of the day. Actually, what I'm doing now, we talked about earlier, is I make fresh celery juice in the morning Mm. and have that. It's supposed to do all sorts of wonderful things for your hydrochloric acid and whatnot. And then I, I have breakfast after that. But, you know, that takes some time in the morning. So I set my work day, because I am lucky enough to be able to set my own hours, to start at 10 a.m. I also use a service called Batched Inbox. So all my emails from the past 24 hours show up in my inbox at 10 a.m. And this has been such a blessing to me, because I was always trying to finish the emails before I would set about working on my next book or doing something with my husband or playing ball with my dog or some of these really important things. Mm -hmm. And I finally realized at a gut level and not just an intellectual level, they're never going to end. Your inbox will never be empty, but this way the inbox can be empty. And that gives me that feeling of accomplishment, kind of like in the old days when the shopkeeper would turn that sign on the door from open to closed. And then I don't have to think about it until the next morning. So there are lots of tools and different things that help us for whatever is giving us angst. Maybe for somebody listening, it's not email, it's something else. But under the sun, (laughs) in this best of all possible worlds, there are ways to help you with what's driving you nuts. Oh, good. Oh, good. (laughs) (laughs) That right there is worth the entire interview. (laughs) There are things to help you. Speaking of the celery juice, and we mentioned in the intro that your um, other books revolve around Main Street Vegan, which is your website, MainStreetVegan.net. And you've also established the Main Street Vegan Academy. You want to just touch on a little bit about how you got there and what that's all about? (laughs) Well, you know, life is always such an interesting path. So I first heard the word vegetarian uh, from my grandmother when I was five years old Mm -hmm. and remember thinking, wow, that is interesting. There's so much I don't know about. And it kind of stuck in my head. And then when I was 17, I got into yoga, which at that time, yoga was weird. I mean, Mm -hmm. people confused it with yogurt and they were both just... (laughs) Both are weird, right? Um, But all the yoga books said, if you're going to be serious about yoga, you need to be vegetarian. So I I did become vegetarian in my late teens and that was pretty easy. 
I didn't hear about ve uh, veganism, which um, vegetarians don't eat anybody with a face or a mother, <laughs> and don't eat anything that came from an animal. So no eggs, no, no dairy, as well as meat, fish, and fowl. And I got it because, um, for example, a cow has to be impregnated, give birth, separated from the baby, and that happens every year so that she can give milk and there's great pain and suffering and sorrow and all that. I didn't want to support that, mm -hmm. but I was a practicing binge eater. And so I had to get recovery for that situation before I could change my diet. So that took me a long time, but it's just another story in believing in people because there weren't a lot of vegans at that time. We're talking the 1970s. But um, there was a beautiful couple in, in New Jersey who had started the American Vegan Society in 1960. They were very mm. forward thinking and they never gave up on me. And so when I finally got the recovery for the eating disorder in a 12-step program and was able to make choices about what I was going to eat, I wanted to do vegan. I had wanted it for a long time. And they had been standing by waiting for me. You know, they never said, oh, well, we're sick of you. You're never going to get this. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> never. And so, um, so I've been vegan for a really long time, uh, since 1983. I wrote probably the first book about veganism ever to come from a, a regular publisher back in the 80s um, mm. and wrote a few books about that early on. And then I thought, okay, I've done all I can do about this. I had a degree in comparative religions. I'm fascinated by the big picture and the meaning of life. So I went out and wrote books like Creating a Charmed Life, and had the two Oprah things and, you know, it was great and heady and amazing and fabulous. And then in 2010, I just had this strong pull to come back into the vegan world and write another book. So I wrote Main Street Vegan and it did really well and it spawned all sorts of other things, uh, a weekly podcast, Main Street Vegan and Main Street Vegan Academy that you're talking about. So one of my favorite tweeters, very successful businessman, would tweet often something along the lines of, if you want to be successful, help other people be successful. Yes. Now, I'm a certified health coach. I have a, a certificate in plant-based nutrition. And so I was doing some one-on-one. -on -one. I was still doing a lot of speaking as a motivator and that kind of thing. But I could tell that the world was changing and that publishing was not going to be you know, where it had been. And I wanted to do something, but the one-on-one -on -one was not it. And then the idea came to me, I want to train vegans to be coaches. I'm already trained as a health coach. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually, for that matter, certified as a life coach as well. So I know what I like in those programs and I know what I don't. And I know what I would want if I was going for vegan uh, lifestyle coach and educator training. So I put all that together, put it out into the world. Now, remember, I had not been in the vegan world as a writer at that time for 15 years. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was still a vegan, but I didn't have a reputation in that particular market, except for a few people who remembered me from way back when. But it was meant to be. 13 people showed up for the first class, and we have now had um, 400 graduates from 28 countries on six continents. <laughs> <laughs> and they come to New York City for a magical six days with a fabulous faculty and terrific field trips. And then they leave with this certification. And I'm very clear. I don't promise. I don't say anywhere on the website, yeah, take this course, quit your day job. No, no, no. But some people have. There are some people who, who are full-time vegans. I'm so proud of all my graduates, but one of them, uh, uh, Kat Mendenhall, has a cowboy boot company in Dallas. Because if you're in Dallas, you need cowboy boots, even if you're vegan. And so they're made from all natural, man-made materials, all made in America. She was featured in Oprah's Magazine in August. Uh, she just did a photo shoot for Vanity Fair. We have a, another graduate actually out in, in your part of the world in, in Colorado Springs, JL Fields. 
She runs the Colorado Springs Vegan Cooking Academy now. She's written three cookbooks for real publishers. She does executive coaching about food and cooking. And so it's really magical. And I think for anybody maybe listening who kind of maybe wants to get out of corporate, wants to do something, think about, is there something in your field? Is there something in your hobby or your area of passion that you can help somebody else become more successful? Because I found for me, that was the ticket. Just to reiterate, we're talking about taking